has already introduced. And when I was 12 years old, I was in seventh grade, and that was a very important year for me. Um, that year is the year that I started taking my faith into my own hands. I started taking the, uh, the faith that I had grown up with, and I started taking ownership of it. I made it my own. Uh, and I, I took the step to be baptized, to demonstrate to others the decision that I had made to take my faith as my own and to follow Jesus with it. And there's a couple of things that happened that year uh, in my life that helped push me to make that decision. The first thing that happened was I went with my family on a trip to a place called Sun River, which was a place that we frequented. My grandparents had a home there, um, and I was homeschooled. So we had a good amount of time to be able to go and get away and to go do fun things. And so one thing that we did on a particular trip to Sun River when I was 12 years old was we went to the driving range and we went golfing. And I had taken, uh, I had taken some golf lessons for a couple of years, and so I was helping my two younger siblings and my mom, who hadn't had the same training that I had. Uh, I, I was helping show them the proper stance that they should take with uh, putting their feet about the distance of their shoulders, uh, how to bend their knees a little bit and keep their backs straight as they lean over the ball to swing and follow through with the shot. And I was, I was helping them improve their golf shot, basically. But kind of afterward, my dad pulled me aside and he said, you're a good teacher. And that very simple little comment stuck with me. Uh, that it, he, he helped me realize something about myself in that moment, which is that I have an ability, naturally, to teach. The second experience that really helped me take ownership of my faith when I was 12 was that was the first time ever that I had been involved in serving. The church that I went to in Eugene has a camp, and the camp is basically for elementary age kids and it's high schoolers and college age students who basically run the camp, but they let seventh and eighth graders help. We were counselor assistants. And so when I was 12 years old, that was the first time that I was old enough to help at this camp. And so we got to do fun things, run around, play games with the kids. But one of the things that I got to do was I got to use this gift that I knew that I now had of teaching. So one of the things that I got to do was help 
teach the Bible stories for the kids. And then afterwards, sitting down with my smaller group of kids, I could then walk through and, and help point them to the truth found in God's Word. I got to use my gifts that I had discovered that I had to point people to Jesus. But I learned something in that serving experience, which is that not everybody has the same gift. And not everybody has the same degree of the same giftedness. For instance, while I had the ability to teach those Bible stories, some of my peers did not have that ability at all. At the same time, some of them had that same ability, and some of them were even better teachers than I was. Some of them had that ability, but they weren't as good of teachers as I was. But regardless, not all of us had that same ability, and not all of us had the same degree of that ability. That was something that I learned that year. And... This morning, we're going through 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. And I'm going to read them just so that uh, they're, they're sticking with us. They say this, it says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. And we're going to come back and examine this passage to see what it is that Peter is saying to us. But to sum it up in one sentence, a simple sentence, we can sum up this passage like this. Keeping the end in mind, love one another by using the gifts that he has given you to serve others. And the result of that is that God will be glorified. So I'll say that again. Keeping the end in mind, love one another by using the gifts that God has given you to serve others. And the result is that God will be glorified. So that this, this passage leaves us with a few questions that we need to answer to really understand what it is that Peter's saying to us. First, what's the connection between us serving others and how God is glorified? What does it mean that we have gifts? And what does it mean that we need to love one another by using those gifts? And what does it mean that we need to keep the end in mind? We're going to look at what Scripture has to say about each one of those parts so that we can see what it is that that Peter is really trying to teach us, what it is the lesson that Peter wants us to walk away from knowing and doing and how we can move forward into the rest of our life different as a result of these words. Last week in youth group, Tuesday night, uh, for those of you who are in junior high and high school, I hope to see you there. We meet Tuesdays up at the barn, 6.30. Um, last week in youth group, we talked about uh, how... God created the heavens and the earth. We talked about the story of creation from Genesis chapter 1, at the beginning of the Bible. And we talked about specifically focusing in on the sixth day of creation, the last day that God spent making things. And on that day, it says that God made mankind in his image. It doesn't tell us a whole lot about who God is, but what it does tell us in that passage is that God specifically created us in his image. And we know things about God, like he is big, he is powerful, he is infinite, and he's incredibly complicated, incredibly complex. So since we are made in his image, it shouldn't surprise us that we are different one from another. And further, our differences demonstrate God's goodness and paint a more complete picture of who he is. If every single one of us has a little bit of God living inside of us, then you would expect that as a whole, we more completely fill that picture of who God is. We need every single person to make up this collective whole of who God is. We just reflect a small fraction of who God is. And Paul takes this idea and this understanding about being created in the image of God in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, and he applies it with a, with a really, really helpful analogy for us. And I'm going to read just a little bit of it for you. It may be familiar to a lot of you, but it says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Or if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of hearing be? Or if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. And if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts and yet one body. Now you are the body of Christ, both individually and as members of it. Each one of us is made unique and different by design. Each one of us is made in the image of God, exactly as Genesis says. But what Paul says here is that not only are each of us made in the image of God, but each one of us is made unique. Each one of us is different, and we all bring different things to the table. Paul uses this understanding of a body because it makes a lot of sense to us. Like he says, if the entire body was an ear, the body wouldn't be able to actually see. The body wouldn't be able to smell. The body wouldn't be able to speak. The body wouldn't have hands to grab anything. If the whole body were an eye, the body wouldn't be able to hear or be able to speak or to be able to grab anything. We would be limited in our ability, which is why we need all of us as a collective whole in order to form this actual body that's usable. And that's I think what I began to understand when I was 12 and I had that experience serving, I started realizing that we aren't all gifted the same. It would have been very easy for me to, to evaluate my worth uh, in that serving experience based on those around me. I could have looked at myself with those who weren't good at teaching and I could have said, I am better than them because I can teach and they can't. Or I could have looked at those who were also good at teaching but who weren't as good as me and I could have done the same thing. Or I could have looked at those who were better than me at teaching, and I could have said, well, I'm not a very good teacher because look at them. If I based my own self and my own self-worth on everyone around me, I would have been missing the point that we need everybody. Because even those who weren't gifted at teaching had other ways that they were able to serve those kids and to do so really well. We all have gifts and we all have abilities that we need to bring to the table together. Together we make up this body of Christ in order that we best reflect a more complete picture of this image of God in which we've been created. It's this idea of the body of Christ. A body is the, the physical aspect of who a person is. So if we are made in the image of God, then what does the image of God look like? So it's sort of ingenious for Paul to use this idea of the body of Christ because the body is the reflection of God. When we are all coming together and working together, that is how we best reflect this image of God in which we've been created. We need everyone's giftedness. But again, there are also different degrees to which we have abilities. In Matthew chapter 25, there's this parable that Jesus gives, and we won't spend the time to actually read through the whole parable, but basically there's a master who has three servants, and the master's going away, and he gives each one of his servants talents. Uh, to the first servant, he gives five talents. To the second servant, he gives two talents. And to the third servant, he gives one talent. And the master goes away. He's entrusted his servants with these talents. And the first servant takes his talents, and he applies them, and he puts them to work. And the result is that he doubles them. He ends up with ten talents. The second servant does the same thing. He takes his two talents, and he uses them, and he applies them, and he ends up with four talents. And the third servant, it says that he was basically insecure about his talents. He recognized uh, that he didn't want to let down his master. And so rather than give himself an opportunity to let down his master, he took his talent and he buried it. Inevitably, the master comes back and he brings his servants to himself to see what they have done with the talents that he has given them. And the first servant says, Master, you gave me these five talents and I worked and I used them and I applied them and now I have ten talents. And the master's response was, well done, my good and faithful servant. You will be blessed. And so that servant goes away. And the next servant comes up and says, Master, you gave me these two talents, and I worked, and I used them, and I applied them, and I doubled them, and now I have four talents. And the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You will be blessed. And then that servant went away. And then the third servant came up. And he says, Master, I know that you are harsh. I didn't want to let you down, and I was kind of insecure about what you had given me. So I took your talent and I buried it so that nothing bad would happen to it. And the master responded, you wicked servant, away from me. And he took his talent and he gave it to the others who had done well with theirs. And basically the moral of this story is that God has given each one of us a, a talent, an ability, a giftedness, if you will. Uh, we have a different part that we play in the body. But what's interesting, based on what Jesus says in this parable, is that 
Not all talents are distributed equally. However, the rewards are. You might think of someone uh, in particular, and you, and you might have in your mind, man, that is a person who is so gifted. I want to be like them, but there's no way I could ever be like them. Um, you might think of an evangelist like Billy Graham, someone who is famous for having traveled the world leading people to Jesus. And he led thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people to Jesus over the course of his life. He's world-renowned even, even after his death. Uh, his books are still read. His memoir is read. People know Billy Graham for his ability as an evangelist, as a preacher of God's word. And if I was measuring my ability to teach God's word off of Billy Graham, I could be really disappointed uh, in that I would never have the sort of reach that Billy Graham would have. Not all talents are distributed equally. However, as this parable makes clear, the rewards, or simultaneously the lack thereof, are distributed equally. For the first servant, who had been given five talents to start out with, he worked and he applied his, and he ended up doubling the amount to ten. The second servant was given two, and he worked equally hard and ended up doubling his to four. So both of those first two servants put in the same amount of effort and had the same sort of exponential result. They both doubled what they had started out with. And when the master came back and he, he, he evaluated their work, he didn't say, you started with five and you ended with ten, and ten is so much better, so you're getting an extra reward. He said he blessed them both equally. He told both of them, well done, good and faithful servant, you will be blessed. They both received that equally, even though they didn't start out with the same number, and even though they didn't end with the same number. Our gain or our loss of a reward is based on how we use what God has given us. God may not have given you an ability to do X, Y, or Z. Whatever you compare yourself to, whomever you compare yourself to, maybe you won't be as high of a, uh, a person with that set of skill or that set of giftedness as the person you're evaluating yourself as. But the reality is that God has designed you to be the way that you are. God has given you the gifts that he has given you, and he has placed you where you are to use them. So you can't avoid using your gifts simply because, well, I'm not Billy Graham, so why would I even try? God has wired each and every one of us, and we need everyone's giftedness. And this explains a lot of what Peter was saying. Again, he says, keeping, in, the, keeping the end in mind, love one another by using the gifts that he's given you to serve others. And the result is that God will be glorified. Each one of us have gifts that we are to use in order to serve others, and the result is that God will be glorified. When each one of us are contributing to the that we belong to, we best reflect the image of God to the world. We display God's glory to the world. So when we use the gifts that God has given us, God is glorified as a result of that because the world can see him for who he is. He can see, or the world can see his true colors. It's through us. The world sees God through us. And that keeping the end in mind refers to when the master comes back. Someday when God returns to take us to heaven, like Mark was mentioning earlier, that eventually we will all meet God. When that end comes, there's going to be a reward divvied out to us based on how we did with what God has given us. That reward is not based on our salvation. We have that. We're going to experience eternal life. But the sort of eternal life that we get to experience is based off of this gift that God has given to each and every one of us. How did we use what God has given us? Did you use it to serve others in love and glorify God as a result of that? But the last piece that we're missing here is the part about using our gifts in love. And Mark had brought up uh, 1 John 4, where John says that God is love. And he even brought up what Jesus said about the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second most important commandment that really goes hand in hand with it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Those two commandments are inextricably linked. But it starts with the understanding that God is love. If God is love and we are made in the image of God, then we are made to be creatures of love. So it would make a lot of sense then that our number one responsibility in life, especially as people who follow after God and people who are born in his image, would be that we love him with everything that we, are, with everything that we have, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And what Peter does here in 1 Peter 4 is he connects who God is, that he is love, and the fact that we are made in God's image, so we are creatures in love, 
are creatures of love. He, he, he connects that understanding of love to the idea of serving. What Peter is saying here is that keeping the end in mind, keeping our reward in mind, we are to love one another by serving them, using the gifts that he has given us. And the result is that God will be glorified. Love is basically the key to this equation. We love God by serving others. God is love. We are creatures of love like God. So we should share that love with others. The way that we do that is by serving. The way that we do that is by using the gifts that God has given us. So the question is, and this is really what Peter leaves us off with, is that based on this understanding, based on what our understanding is about who God is and who we are in relation to him, we are required to use what he has given us to love others. So the question is, when you leave here today, when you go into your regular work week, school week, uh, home week, whatever it is, uh, how are you going to use what God has given you to serve others out of love? How are you going to take what God has given you, whether that's a gift of teaching, whether that's a gift of, of leadership, whether that's a gift of hospitality or giving, uh, whatever it is that God has given you, how are you going to take that and use that to serve others in love? If you need ideas, come talk to somebody on staff. Um, staff people tend to know lots of different ways that you could apply yourself in the church. But how can you apply yourself outside of the church? How can you go outside of the four walls of this church and use what God has given you? Because ultimately, your reward is dependent on how you apply those gifts in your life. Your reward is dependent on how you use what God has given you to serve and love others. So as you leave here, how are you going to use what God has given you to serve others in love? And before we close with worship, Mark has one last story to share with you all about the profound impact that one small service toward others out of love can have and the difference that it can also make in your life. Speaking of Billy Graham, I just want to leave us with a story I've mentioned it before um, from, well, more than a few decades ago now. There were businessmen in North Carolina who wanted to host and put on a, a, a crusade, an evangelistic crusade where the gospel could be presented to the community. And they, they tried to get, um, who was a very famous at the time, evangelist, um, and his name was Billy Sunday, uh, believe it or not. Uh, but he was unavailable, and so they arranged to have a lesser-known, but still uh, fairly well-known um, preacher, Mordecai Ham, uh, come to the crusade. There was a, a group of young men, numbered among them was who we know now as Billy Graham, who thought, you know, just as a lark, go and, and uh, see what this guy had to say. Well, the, the seats were all taken up. And uh, they couldn't find any place to sit down inside of uh, this uh, tent crusade. And they were about to leave when an usher stopped them and said, Hey, uh, there's some seats up in the, where the choir sits that we could have you sit up there. And so they took them up on it. And, of course, um, by the end of the service, uh, Billy Graham, who was not a Jesus follower, uh, made the decision to become a Jesus follower that, that very night and gave his heart to the Lord. And, of course... I, I don't know that anyone hasn't heard of the name of Billy Graham. And uh, as, as uh, Andrew referenced here, who's traveled literally the entire world um, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, and, and hundreds of thousands of people have responded uh, to that message of the gospel and committed and devoted themselves to being Jesus' followers. And, and the point of this story is that Billy Graham, who hasn't heard of him, or Billy Sunday, not, now I realize that we're going back in time and you may not have been familiar with that, but he certainly was, people knew about, he was a five talent kind of uh, preacher in his day, as was Morde, Mordecai Ham. And so we are familiar uh, with names like that. But does anyone here know the name of that usher? Anyone know the name of that usher? The guy who helped these kids find a place to sit and, and listen to the gospel message. I, I don't either. Don't have to feel, <laughs> you know, you failed the test. Uh, but God does. God knows the name of that usher. 
And, and God knows the name of the people right now who are up in the nursery rocking um, our babies. And God knows the name of the people who came early today to uh, ice the water and tea and make the coffee. God knows, and so do I, the name of one of those gals who helps out with coffee, uh, Laura Goodwin, who drives from Albany and comes, you know, an hour early to service and makes coffee. And... Um, and has done so for a couple of years when she moved to Albany, continued to, to be a part of our fellowship and to serve here. Do you know Laura Goodwin? God does. She, she, um, she, one Sunday, it was about a half hour, 40 minutes after church had started, and I saw her coming back to the service. She was halfway to Lebanon when she realized, oh, you know what, I forgot to clean up the coffee stuff and came back from Lebanon all the way back, you know, on home, home to Albany. She just has this heart to serve. Now she's moved to Kaiser, which is a little unreasonable to the church here. And yet, you know, she's continued to serve because we don't, we're, she, she knows she, she's not serving coffee. She's serving people coffee. And she's doing what she can um, to the glory of God. Um, to hide a 300-pound man who's really nervous about being in church for the first time behind a six-ounce cup of coffee in his styrofoam cup. And she gets it. George Virtue Sr. got it. And to the degree that he would drive kids on missions trips down to Mexico in a bus, you know, that from here to Mexico. And he was no spring chicken doing this. But he had a... He had a, a a young, passionate heart for the things of God and serving Jesus for what he could do, like he did in the Awanis program. And and I would guess that many of you here never heard of George Bush or Senior before today. But God did. And right now he's hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, I've trusted you just with it seems maybe insignificant to you, but it isn't insignificant. And so, Father in heaven, we pray, God, that for every servant of yours in this fellowship who, um, who labors in the trenches and, um, and, and it's seemingly no one knows or few people know, and maybe sometimes like no one even cares, God, that you do. And it all matters because every part of the body of Christ has a meaningful and significant role. And God, you've called us not to success as the world imagines it with celebrity and fame and all of that, that you measure it in faithfulness. So God, I especially pray for everyone who's kind of sitting on the sidelines uh, thinking that um, that you've not really placed them in any place to make a difference or giving them any particular uh, gifts or uh, passions or um, abilities, and yet they couldn't be further from the truth. And so God, I pray, especially for those of us who have just been holding back, that God, this year, moving into this new season, um, that we would all man our battle stations, God, and serve you faithfully, and, and, and do it to your glory, because in the end, uh, that is what matters, so we uh, pray that you would be glorified, God, thank you for this uh, time here today, thank you for Andrew, and, and uh, opening the word here today, and the truth of it, God, help it to uh, produce fruit in our individual lives, we pray, and pray for us to respond Oh, 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 oh,